The dating apps are under a lot of pressure. Falling revenues, people not wanting to pay, and Gen Z uninterested in dating have led to collapsing stocks and circling activist investors. Their only path forward is monetization. But what does that mean for the demographic crisis? Apps may be looking for ways to monetize. People everywhere are liking, swiping, winking in the hopes of finding a match for life or at least for the night. Tinder is the world's largest community. So in the US, what's happened with online dating is it's amazing for the top 10% of attractiveness of men. It's okay for the top half. It is a disaster for the bottom half. All you have to do is break out a credit card. Would you ever pay for a date again? I would not. No, never. No, definitely not. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I would not pay for a dating app. Dating apps, like most apps, solve a matchmaking problem. DoorDash connects customers to food. Uber connects riders and drivers. And dating apps theoretically should connect two people who want to be in love. According to the Census Bureau, about 47% of the US population has never been married, about 117 million people, and almost 60 million people in the US, about 3 in 10 people, have used online dating services. That number skyrockets if we do a little bit more age bucketing. Of almost 60% of people under 50 have used the apps. Dating apps promise love. The entire premise is pretty straightforward. As Jader and Wooden wrote, the apps give somebody the opportunity to break free from geographic constraints and match with someone who shares your interests and preferences. It's algorithmic matchmaking. Or more simply, hey, you might find someone who you never would have found using our special algorithm, which sometimes might work against you if we can make money on it, but at least promises a base set of occurrences of potential love thanks for paying. And it works for a lot of people, but the stocks right now look like this, and that is going to make them do things that are scary, like over monetizing and creating a very bad user experience that is potentially going to have unexpected consequences for the demographics of the United States. So let's talk about the beginning. Dating apps began with Match.com back in 1995. There had been online romances and a look behind the scenes at one online dating service called Match.com. Match was taking advantage of the rapid rise of the World Wide Web and the shifting trend of people waiting later to marry. Match was a byproduct of the online classified section and people loved it. By the early 2010s, dating apps became the norm. More and more people had smartphones in their pockets and the game of love became something that you could just carry around. Grindr, a geosocial app for gay men, launched in 2009. Enter Grindr, the so-called gayberhood in your pocket. One of our straight um, counterparts kind of classifies itself as like the app to be deleted, right? We are the opposite. We are the app to be kept <laughs> because people might get into a long-term relationship, but they still on Grindr very actively. The dating industry continued to grow and Match decided that rather than compete with everybody, they would buy everybody. And so they bought everybody. Uh, they purchased OkCupid, a top competitor in 2012. And this began the reign of what I like to call the Match.Mafia. They were ruthless in acquisition and single-mindedly focused on monetizing love and love lost. Almost one in five dating app users are on Hinge. Don't like it? You can just switch to another app. Except, of course, almost all of them are owned by Match Group anyway. These days in the United States, dating is basically the domain of one giant corporation. Now, if you believe what they tell you, your perfect matches are out there somewhere on the apps. But one way or another, match groups algorithms decide whether you get to meet. The big three were created. So Tinder launched in 2012, Match purchased them in 2017 for $3 billion, and was the first time that online dating was cool, scientifically speaking. Tinder made it fun. And that's why more than half of people between 18 to 29 years old have used a dating app because it's fun. Tinder is the world's largest community to meet new people um, anywhere in the world. Hinge came along in 2012, purchased by Match in 2018, and was meant to be the relationship-minded app popular with millennials and Gen Z. It is a mobile-only experience with a higher level of intent. And it's not a pure hookup app like its competitor, Tinder. It's the app that's designed to be deleted. Hinge was created in 2012, the same year as Tinder. It was also bought by Match Group, 
Bumble came along in 2014, a novel app giving <laughs> women like, the chance to message first. Uh, it's a, it was a good premise. Uh, and the company was founded by Whitney Wolfhard, formerly of Tinder, quickly became popular. They went public in 2021. Match.com did not buy them because Bumble has badu money. This is an ecosystem of human connections and using technology as a bridge to build healthier and more equitable relationships. Match has a portfolio of 40 plus companies, including Tinder, Hinge, Match, OkCupid, okay, Plenty of Fish, Meetic, The League, and a bunch of other insert name here, People Meet type apps like Pet People Meet, with almost 15 million paying users across the world. It seems like the apps have a great thing going for them, right? Uh, no, they don't. What Match has done quite well is buy other properties that then people will go from a Tinder to one of their other properties. And that's the magic, having a portfolio of dating apps. That's really the ideal business model. Grindr is the only app that isn't going up against their users. The other two are Match separated from their parent company, IAC, in 2020, and both Ryan Reynolds and Wendy Murdoch joined their board. They had a ma market cap of $30 billion then. Now their market cap is $9 billion. Bob, what are your thoughts on the stocks? <laughs> Um, I'm tempted to say swipe left. He might be right. Match reported earnings on July 31st and posted slowing growth. Tinder is up 1% and payers are down 5%. Hinge is still doing quite well at 48% in the quarter due to growth in users and the a la carte options, which we will discuss later. But there is stagnation and their stock prices do reflect that. And it's a sin for a stock price to go down. Elliott Management bought a $1 billion stake in Match and sent funds. Starboard is looking because they are activist investors. Match needs to make money or die. And things aren't so great outside of the Match.com mafia either. Bumble is down over 90% since their IPO. On August 8th, Bumble shares fell 38% at the open, the largest drop on record. Their earnings report showed that they were nervous about their future, much like their users, had missed revenue and are totally <laughs> rethinking their entire strategy, which is not what these guys want to hear. And so why are these stocks flailing and it's because people are unhappy. Match and Bumble reported slow revenue growth for their, for their most recent quarters at four and 3% respectively. People no longer want to monetize their loneliness, but that's the plan that dating apps have for them. Many people aren't finding love and seem to be giving up. The number of monthly active dating app users worldwide has dropped from 287 million people in 2020 to 237 million people in 2023, according to The Economist. Part of the reason that less people are using the dating apps is that less people are interested in dating. In this graph from Pew Research, it shows that 50% of single people are tapped out of the dating market. According to Morning Consult, 79% of women are uninterested in returning to dating apps. And if there are no women on the apps, it creates a really big problem for men who are seeking a romantic connection with a woman. But the bottom half of attractiveness of men based on online attractiveness are totally shut out of the market. And as a result, in America, one in three males under the age of 30 has not had sex in the last 12 months. And the knock-on effect here is that we're producing too many of what is the most dangerous person in the world, and that is a young, broken, alone man. When you hear about mass shooters in the US, you know who they are before you know who they are. To be clear, the apps do work for some people. I know a lot of people who have met on the apps and they're happy. According to Pew Research, one in five partnered adults under 30 met on a dating app. It's a brilliant way to get outside of, you know, your bubble post-pandemic. Who is anybody? Who is that person that you're seeing that you might want to talk to, but you don't know how? So you'll see if you're connecting on the app and then you connect on the app and then you cross paths. And it's kind of cosmic in that sense, right? And there's a reason that 10% of adults met their significant other on the apps, rising to 20% for the under 30s, and it's because they can work. The dating app business model isn't working anymore because the stocks are going down and they're going to want to over monetize. And what does that look like? It's a mismatch between user and platform. The consumers and the company have competing goals. If you ask single adults what dating is like right now. I feel fatigued is probably a really good word. They might say something like. It's just so <laughs> hectic right now and it's really hard to find a genuine connection. I feel so defeated right now. The dating apps want you to continue paying into perpetuity because your subscription and subsequent inability to find love is how they make money. Their business model is you being lonely 
only in a lot of cases. I'm being dramatic, but it's a little bit true. Morgan Stanley, always business-minded, wrote this on the app's opportunity to monetize. A focus on getting users who are already paying to increase their spending could be one tactic toward growth, as analysts believe the top 1% of dating spenders remain heavily under-monetized. Additionally, apps could target payers who can't afford monthly subscriptions or premium features with more a la carte features or weekly subscriptions. Even the holdouts who prefer not to pay at all offer a large revenue opportunity via advertising. You are dollar signs to a lot of dating app companies, okay? But you want to find love. As Planet Money has described, Hinge has a freemium model. If you really want to play the game of love, you have to pay up. You have to pay up for things like roses, which are a way to signal to somebody that you think the algorithm did a great job, but they're super hot. You can also pay for unlimited likes, see who likes you, set more preferences, boost visibility, etc. You can gamify the game, you can attack the algorithm, it all becomes money at the end of the day. Almost 30% of Americans have paid for dating apps, spending almost $20 a month on a la carte purchases like the Rose or the Super Like or subscriptions. Hinge Plus is $100 for six months and that allows users to like an unlimited number of people, see who likes them, blah, blah, blah. My brother paid for dating apps and we had a little chat about it. It was on Hinge that I actually would spend money on dating apps. They were able to give me because they gave me a nice little promo of 50% off and I was like, why not? I might as well see what's happening. When you buy it, uh, everything kind of changes. The algorithm becomes a lot more friendly. I was using it pretty heavily without it. And it can just be a bit of a grind and you only get eight likes a day um, before that. And so this gives you unlimited likes, but what it also does is it puts you first. So you become priority in, in my case, the woman's stack of likes that they may get. And so now I'm bumped to the top. You're going to have to pay potentially at a certain point. Like I still think you can exist without paying, but your life just becomes easier if you pay. So obviously to stay afloat, these companies have to make money. And so I think that it works and it can work if you go on with the right mindset and you are willing to pay. And of course it's not all bad, paying as part of the appeal. Like part of the reason that Ryan got more app, app matches is because he was like, hey, I'm pretty serious about this dating thing, you know, match me. Some see it as an investment, some see it as time curation, some see it as extractive. Dating is not easy. Every human being is infinitely complex and algorithmic matchmaking can simplify the complexity for pairing purposes, but it is a large task to tackle. Every dating app works slightly differently, but whichever you think gives you the best chance at finding love, this Valentine's Day, remember that your ideal match might very well be the algorithm. A little dark there. Numerous articles have been pinned on the problems with dating apps and the problems that they're creating in society. Tinder and the dawn of the dating apocalypse was written almost 10 years ago about how Tinder was morphing modern dating culture into hookup culture, which made Tinder tweet out a bunch of things and get really dramatic, but like they were so defensive that I was like, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of truth here. But it's not the app's fault. We were kind of already trending in this direction of looser relationships, less marriage, yeah, you know, not having kids, and it's economic. And there's all sorts of words that tie into these various articles and Instagram stories and YouTube videos and TikTok videos and LinkedIn posts about dating. And it is, these words are immediate gratification, choice paralysis, the millennial lifestyle, subsidy, and zero sum mindset. But I also think there's something called the convenience contradiction where we think things should be like way easier and cheaper than it actually is. Like Lyft, for example, DoorDash, like those things have messed us up. And now we have the dating apps being like, hey, it should be really easy for you to find love. You should be able to walk out your front door, fall into the arms of a beautiful stranger and get married in the sunset. But it doesn't work like that. Dating apps, like most things that seem easy and cheap, but in reality are hard and expensive, are of course a byproduct of zero interest rate phenomenons of easy money, fast checks, the appification of society fueled by a land of low interest rates and herd mentality by VCs. The apps are struggling now because they have to prove profitability and are experiencing platform decay. And it turns out it costs money to grow, free money isn't free, etc. Now everyone is no longer grinning and laughing 
laughing and chanting, you know, it's like there's a single tear now rolling down their cheek being like, what are the margins of this business? We have to have a return. Where's the money? And the money is the users. And it's no problem paying if it works. Let's set that up front. No problem with paying if it works. But part of the issue is that we do have a demographic crisis. 41% of online dating users over 30 have paid for the app, but only 22% of the under 30s have paid. So not only are the youngs not paying, but they're also not interested in dating. A little over half of Gen Zers were in a romantic relationship during their teen years, compared to three quarters of baby boomers and Gen Xers. I was not in a serious romantic relationship until I was 26. <laughs> There's a lot of people like me. So what happens next? There is a convenience contradiction here too, where love feels like it should be easy. And if you feel like you're failing at something that should be easy, you're going to be upset. That's what happened to me. I was like, is something wrong with me? Why am I so bad at this? But it's, it's, <laughs> it's just hard most of the time. Some people get lucky. Gen Z is not down with the apps. Only 21% of college and graduate students use dating apps once a month, according to an Axios slash Generation Lab survey. This age group is shrinking too. There's just less young people than there used to be. And this is where the data gets interesting because as a Guardian survey pointed out, um, a lot of men are single. 63% of men are, are single. They qualify themselves as single, 34% of women. And it's the same sort of breakdown for LGB men and LGB women. There are all sorts of complications with that survey and like how people qualify singleness because a guy could be like, you know, I see that girl once a month and that girl could be like, that's my husband, you know? And so there's a mismatch because surveys are, are um, flawed. And so take that with a grain of salt. And as the Guardian points out, the men aren't dating, but they're also not hanging out in general. According to a USA Today survey, only 21% of young men received emotional support from a friend within the past week versus 41% of women. So we have two problems, right? Number one, the foundation of relationshiphood is really difficult. It's a structural affordability problem that I talk about all the time. Housing is expensive, cars are expensive, elder care, child care, etc. There is no underlying foundation to build a relationship. The average age of leaving home in the 1990s was 23. Now it's 26. You really can't have a romantic relationship if you don't have a foundation to build anything on. And we also have a aging population. The fertility rate is 1.8, far below the replacement rate of 2.1. By 2040, every one in five Americans will be 65 or older, up from one in every eight in 2000. So the US population is aging and we need either more legal immigration or we need more partnerships and babies and the dating apps can help out with that. Social security, Medicare, Medicaid, and elder care are all going to become bigger issues. Elder care is on average $5,000 a month. The sandwich generation, Gen X, is now squished between paying for aging parents and then paying for childcare. Same with some elder millennials. Baby boomers are retiring. 43% of them have no retirement savings. They'll have to be taken care of. And the number of 65 plus singles is forecasted to expand from 26.3 million in 2021 to 34.4 million in 2030. So these are prime dating app targets, but what about the younger generation? Dating apps are a beacon of hope, but when a lack of love becomes monetizable, what happens to the demographic crisis? Some countries help out newlyweds and they're like, hey, this is big, you know, good job guys, here's some help with housing and childcare costs. It's very tough to build a relationship if you're not secure in a job living with your parents and you can't save money and structural affordability all the way down. But the other end of the extreme of this is that people are paying $190,000 a month for dating app services. Tinder premium is like $500 a month, right? People are looking for love and they're willing to pay. And that's like a business model. And dating apps have changed the way that we interact with one another. Now you don't have to take on that risk of asymmetric commitment. Like if you're like, I'm not sure if they like me back, you don't have to worry about it because you can just tap out. There's now endless optionality as well, a seemingly infinite pool of candidates. And this is something that a lot of my friends run into where they're like, oh, there's someone else out there for me though. Why would I settle for this when I could have this ephemeral thing that doesn't exist? 
why would I settle for the real when I can have a dream? Riddle me that. So when we think about dating apps, in light of the demographic crisis, we have to ask what these business models mean for our future. With the stocks creating Gen Z uninterested and smaller as a cohort, one can only imagine what the payment models in the UI slash UX will look like for the dating apps to make money because they have activist investors to respond to. So there's two fast forward. Number one, meeting somebody in real life. That's what I did. If you can share a hobby with somebody, it, it helps a lot. Running clubs are a good example of this. The dating apps have invested in, uh, in real life experiences. So this is definitely something that think people are thinking about. The second thing would be to unmonetize the apps. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit of federalism. Uh, Japan has a government sponsored dating app and so that could work. And then part of it is probably just an acknowledgement that the online world is not an extension of reality anymore. It's a place that we go. And the guardrails on the apps are, they don't exist. And, and it's really tough because it's like, well, it's a matchmaking service. And what, who can you, like, who are you to be like, hey, don't charge people who are trying to find love. Like, like don't do that. But um, that's a big ask. But with all this being said, we have an aging population and we have a demographic crisis. The dating apps are not at fault for any of them. That's a, that's a different video. And this is not a video saying like, oh, everybody should have babies. I don't care what you do, but this is just meant to draw a parallel between what could be happening with dating apps and the broader demographic crisis that we have because the monetization of love has consequences. And we have to give people avenues to meet in real life. Like post pandemic, it's hard. And not only for like demographics, but for broader vibes too. Because literally love is the only thing that can save us. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for hanging out. I hope that you enjoyed this video. It's available as a newsletter, kyle.substack.com, as well as a podcast called Let's Appreciate. I also post daily short form videos on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on Instagram. You can also check out my book. It's called In This Economy. It's available wherever your books are sold. I hope that you're doing okay out there and hope that uh, you find, find love if that's what you're looking for.